All right. Happy Friday, everyone. And I hope you have had a phenomenal week. We are live with another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we are continuing to explore the landscape of learning technology while cutting through the fluff and getting your questions answered. Today, I'm joined by Tyler Muse. He is the CEO of Lingo Live, and we are going to be talking about personalized coaching of human skills at scale. Uh, so if you're joining us live, go ahead Give us a thumbs up, share the post, tag in somebody who'd benefit from the conversation. And uh, we're about to get started here. And also, while you're at it, comment in, let us know where you are joining us from. Tyler, where are you today? I'm in Dallas, Texas. I was about to write it in the comment box. You were going <laughs> to <laughs> write it in the comments box. Yeah, don't get distracted writing in the comments box. Okay, is it is it uh, warm there? It I'm is. Guessing? Warm would be an understatement. An quite, understatement. Quite yes. Quite hot. <laughs> and you were good. You played tennis this morning too. Is it still, is it super hot in the mornings? It's not. So that's the only time you can really do kind of physical, uh, you know, stuff. Uh, it's uh, kind of high 70s uh, up until 8 a.m., 9 a.m., and then it starts. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> it gets to 95 very fast. Okay. Okay. So you're not p playing tennis out in the scorching heat at uh, one in the afternoon or anything like that. that. But no, not, not us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm in Waukesha. You know, it's been surprisingly cold the past few days, which was great because mm -hmm. my air conditioner had was out for about five days. And fortunately, the temperature dropped. It was in the 50s, uh, which was actually kind of nice uh, considering we didn't have anything. So anyway, with that, before we get going here, before we start talking about the tech, personalized coaching, all that good stuff, your question for today's show. And everybody, feel free to join in along in the comments if you'd like. But we're both dads. We both love being dads. So I thought, hey, let's have some fun with this. So Tyler, if you were to move to Sesame Street, who would be your neighbor and why? Yes. And you did give me a heads up on this. I course. did. I did. So it's not like you just off the top of your head just knew. I greatly appreciate Um so first of all, I'll say quickly, I was a massive fan of Sesame Street as a kid. I was the kid that people made fun of because I was too old to watch Sesame Street. I was like six, still watching Sesame Street, and they were razzing me in the cafeteria. So I really had to think through this one. Um, I think I would choose Snuffleupagus. Snuffleupagus. Okay. Yeah. And why Snuffleupagus? Because he, I think a couple of things. First of all, for the kids. So I have two kids. Um okay. Scarlet and Rocky. And so I'm assuming they're living with me on Sesame Street, in which case. <laughs> okay, right. It's not just you. You didn't, yeah. you didn't go on a trip. Okay. There's, there's there. no life change am I making here? Um, <laughs> so they would love uh, Mastodon, I guess, a woolly mammoth. Whatever, like, yeah, whatever he is. Yeah. Uh, Elephant-esque type creature. I think he was a woolly mammoth. Um, I don't even know if it's a he, to be honest. Anyways, uh, uh Snuffleupagus was also very emotionally intelligent and very like compassionate. So I remember, you know, Big Bird or others when they had problems, Snuffleupagus would always make them feel better. So I think like fun for the kids during the day, they can kind of climb up them and run around. And then for me, if I'm like going through stuff and I just had a rough day, you can just talk to he would. Yeah, he would be there for me. <laughs> OK, got it. You put a, you know what? That's a surprisingly comprehensive answer as to why you chose Snuffleupagus. So I love that. I love that. Okay. So for me, right, mine, hands down, Oscar the Grouch. Okay. Oscar the, I know, right. It sounds like, why would you want to be around someone that grouchy? But to me, I would see it as a challenge, right? My goal would be to make Oscar's day every day. Right. So he'd, he'd come up and be complaining about the trash can or what happened. And my goal would be to make that little guy, crack a smile like can i get oscar to crack a smile now maybe eventually i would need to move because maybe it would eventually grate on my nerves but he was always grouchy but in kind of a fun humorous way and i could and i think i could kind of deal with that i feel like you would regret that decision i feel like after <laughs> day after day after day of trying and failing you would be like what is wrong with me and what is <laughs> i would so start to question but he's he's living in the trash can it's not like i have to deal with him all the time he's just you know i'll wave and, and make a joke and who knows who knows we'll see i don't know somebody i was thinking about this the other day my kids were like elmo i was like no i would regret that decision super fast no super yeah fast. 
Yeah, I ruled out like 90% of them to noise factors. That's just <laughs> way too loud. So Oscar definitely is not a noisy one. So yeah. that, I respect that. Okay. All right. Well, you know, it was funny when we were back before we went live, you, you said like the count and I was thinking maybe you would go there. Tiffany did say the count. So, you know, I, I feel like you would count everything though. You would, you know, you'd be counting the buttons on your shirt as you walk by, but his voice again, noise factor would not be a problem. I don't think. Yes. But I thought about this and the laugh, that ominous laugh, (laughs) Ah, ah, ah. (laughs) very disturbing. You know, it wouldn't be noisy, but it would just be kind of very ominous and disturbing, I think. Okay, okay, that's fair. That's fair. All right. Well, enough enough shenanigans uh, uh, on the front end. We'll, we'll get going here. So you started Lingo Live. We're talking about personalized coaching, all this good stuff, but always curious, what where did that start? What made you say, you know what, I'm seeing a gap in the space and I, and I think I can do something better than what's out there. Yeah. So it's um, the origin story is in a lot of ways kind of drastically different from what we do today. So, yeah, what we do today is personalized coaching for emerging leaders within companies. But I started the business as a um, kind of online marketplace for people to learn a foreign language. So that gives some sense. I think when we first talked, you were still it was still was kind of part of it, right? Well, so we still, yeah, so we still teach English language skills, but okay. I was, um, so the the story is I learned Spanish with a woman in Guatemala over Skype. Okay. Her name is Kathy. I still take lessons with her today. Um, and so basically I was, I, I needed to learn Spanish for my job, but also for my personal life. And I asked my wife to find, a, you know, a private tutor because I knew I didn't need software. Like I know how to learn a language. You need to be exposed to it and you need to work with, um, you know, a native speaker. And I said, I need someone who's available after eight o'clock at night and doesn't cost an arm and a leg. And at the time that was very difficult to find in in Houston where I was living. And she found this woman on Craigslist who had posted and she lives in Guatemala. And this was 2010. That was, that was a weird thing. Like the concept of like connecting over Skype with a stranger and (laughs) for any reason, let alone to learn something was really weird. But, you know, she said the first lesson's free, give it a shot. And I just loved the experience. I thought it was really fun. I thought it was really, um, it was really affordable. Uh, It was super convenient. Um, And so I just kept it up as a hobby. I was working at GE at the time. And um, I was doing it, you know, when I got home from work and I kept it up as a hobby. And after about a year and a half, I became fluent in Spanish. And so I realized, wow, this is not just works. You can do this. Yeah. And so that started, you know, I I quit my job and started a business to help people, you know, learn Spanish. And I quickly learned that most Americans are not willing to spend the time or the money to learn a foreign language. So we pivoted into um, English language uh, instruction. And that slowly evolved to be coaching, which I can get into why, but that's the origin story. Okay. So that's, that's how it started was you were trying to solve a problem for yourself. And then you said, Hey, you know what? I think this, this worked. I'm curious though, when you first started, cause I've run, I've run into this my whole career is that I've always been an advocate that we can do so much virtually and digitally. And there, there's sometimes just this healthy skepticism of, I just don't know if it was, if it'll really work. So did you have any of that when you said, uh, we're going to do this via Skype? I'm, I'm just not sure, but I'll try it. I think I was less hesitant, but okay. I remember specifically telling my coworkers and being looked at like I had a third eye. I mean, I, I, <laughs> my, my boss at GE was like, isn't that kind of creepy? And I think that was the first time I felt that sentiment of this seems crazy to people and there's something really good about that. Like, don't run from that. Um, and I, when I hear that now as an entrepreneur, and I mean, granted, this was 10 years ago, every time somebody talks about something that makes so much sense on paper, but just feels weird, I'm like, that's where innovation happens, right? Like Uber nobody <laughs> when that came out, like, you know what we're gonna have people just use their cars they're gonna drive around they're gonna pick you up 
and yeah. take you places. Yeah, you're like, oh, you pull out your phone and then a stranger pulls up in a Honda Civic and you get in his back seat. Like, what are you talking about? So I think that's where the good stuff is. And at the time, I didn't have that foresight. I was like, oh, maybe there's something wrong with this. But every time I've heard that sense, I'm like, maybe this is that like beautiful kind of spot that it's just not conventional wisdom. There's nothing wrong or creepy about it. It's just not conventional. Different. Wisdom. Okay. Interesting. So then you, you've started with the language skills. You've now really shifted uh, or, or continued or expanded into what I would call human skills, right? The, the soft skills. What led to that pivot? Why, why make the shift? Yeah. So basically, um, you know, we started out working with beginner to intermediate English as a second language working professionals. Yeah. And slowly over time, the folks that were coming to us became more advanced and even fluent English as a second language speakers. And I would say that started to happen in 2015, where you would get, you know, software engineers who um, come from China, India, Eastern Europe, and they're they're fluent or they're they're very advanced. Um, and so the types of things they needed to work on were things like how to speak up in meetings, how to, you know, articulate my ideas concisely, how to write clear emails and better emails. And, um, and so then we realized like, this is not grammar, vocabulary, like instruction. There are parts of that in what they need, but a lot of it is more, as you mentioned, some of these soft skills related to communication. And then what happened was right around 2015, 2016, we became that coaching company and we were able to deliver on that using this skills-based coaching model that we built out. And we had native English speakers that worked with these people saying, hey, I just saw like, you know, Vlad who, yeah, is from Russia, but he speaks English fluently, give an amazing presentation. Like I need to be able to do that for my job. Can I sign up? And so yeah. that's where it started to become, you know, communication skill coaching. And then recently that bled then into, you know, emotional intelligence, how to, um, you know, mitigate conflict on your teams, how to have difficult conversations, how to um, drive results on your teams, kind of came more into the, the leadership bucket. So we didn't pivot from language. We still have. No, you're still doing that, but you've expanded the portfolio, if you will. Exactly. Okay. So before we get into that, because I think we could, uh, there's a lot to unpack in, in the whole human skills coaching, right? What does that all mean? But I do want to kind of help demystify how it works for people just so they understand. Cause I, th I've gotten a little bit of an insider look, but I still personally haven't like really dug under the hood in terms of how it works. So is it just right? What is the platform itself or what is the solution? Yeah. So, um, it's one-on-one -on -one coaching virtually, okay. and those coaches are following this, um, skills-based coaching methodology that we've developed. And okay. so at a high level, the way that works is, you know, if you're focused on language or communication or leadership, those are three kind of separate tracks essentially within our product. We have a catalog of skills, of, of very specific skills that, you know, are gonna be used towards whatever goal that you have in each of those tracks. And so the way the model works is we align with you and your manager on what are those skills, and those serve as like foundational learning components to the one-on-one -on -one coaching. So to give you an example, let's say um, your goal is you wanna focus on the communication track. Yep. And your goal is you wanna be able to articulate your ideas more concisely and clearly. Um, so you and your coach are gonna work on that each week. You're gonna meet each week for one-on-one -on -one sessions through our platform and it's 45 minutes. Um, but but that goal is going to be made up of, of various skills like you're going to need to work on communicating concisely. You're going to need to work on your active listening skills. You're going to need to work on your self-awareness in order to be able to do that. So um, if your English is a second language, you may pick a skill that has to do with pronunciation and, and you know, how if to you decrypt it. You've actually broken down the skill itself. So instead of just saying, hey, it's communications, it's well, yes. And it's these components, these tenants of that. Yes. I don't want to give us too much credit. Like the real work is being done by the coaches who are figuring that out to say, yep. okay, okay. I'm so it's a personalized plan then. 
Exactly. Yeah, I think that's important. You're paying for coaching. It's got to be super personalized to you. That goal is super personalized. You're not choosing that off the shelf. That's something you and your coach come up with. But then the coach is choosing, OK, based on what I know about Christopher, these are the skills that he needs to work on to be able to accomplish this goal. <clears throat> got it. And so is that because you said, right, is that part of like the pre right before they get going, you kind of help identify that before that works. And are they doing that in conjunction? You mentioned their manager, like, is that all part of the process? Yeah. So that's a really important part of it. Um, I think a lot of traditional executive coaching is, um, is really open-ended and it's very sacred between the individual and the coach, right? So there's not really any involvement from the organization to kind of shape where is this program going. Um, so we align with your manager to say, <clears throat> here's that catalog of skills. What do you think Christopher needs to work on? Um, and so that context is passed along to the coach so that when in this fictional example, she is trying to figure out how to help you with that goal, she knows, OK, well, here are these three skills, self-awareness, active listening and, um, you know, communicating concisely that Christopher's manager wants him to focus on. I'm going to make sure that that's part of the plan so that we don't just wholly focus on what the individual works on. And then the most important part of that is we provide 360 assessments. So this is where we use technology. We don't mess with technology when it comes to the actual coaching. We just connect you to the coach and we you know, facilitate the scheduling and all that stuff. But I think really where we're innovating and using the technology is how do you make sure that real behavior change is happening as a result of this skills-based coaching model? And so we'll do pre and post assessments on those skills okay. with managers and with the learner and, and we'll present that data back to say here's how they were rated on these skills when they started here's the how this is actually progressing so we said we were going to improve the skill in these areas we've adapted the actual skill along the way based on what we've learned about them and here's the progress we're seeing so instead yeah. of just it being a yeah i did some things we don't really know what happened there's yeah. actual data coming out of that yeah exactly okay. Okay, so follow up question to that, and then I, somebody asked in the comments, but I'm going to wait one second. Um, is I think the point you brought up right about including the managers really important for sustainability and effectiveness, right? Because if unless somebody's super driven on their own, chances are if they're just like, yeah, I'm doing this thing and I'm not being really held accountable to it, it's it's harder to move forward. Although some of these things, I think people are maybe a little more intrinsically driven but i'm curious there is a fair amount of people who may not necessarily have that type of relationship with their boss right or they may not trust that have you run into that and how do you work with that because maybe i don't really like my boss or i'm not really comfortable with my boss knowing my development opportunities now that's a different problem yeah to solve but i am curious do you run into that it's a great question. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, we're also kind of checking in with direct reports. So it's not purely the manager who is direct reports or key stakeholders that you may not have direct reports. You may you know, be an individual contributor who are people you work with frequently. Um, that's number one. Number two is like this is not wholly aligned to what those folks are saying. You as the individual have a major say in where this program is going. So um, you know, logistically, the way it works is that we ask the coach when you're picking skills with a goal, you pick five skills as a coach that you're going to kind of, you know, develop towards this goal. And three out of the five, 60 percent have to be from these other stakeholders. But the other two. Other, can align. Okay. So that's number one. And then number two is um, this is an 18 week program. So um, 18 or eight to 10, 18, okay. one, eight. So it's about six months because you take some weeks off maybe here or there, but you're meeting, you know, once a week, 18 weeks. And so you're going to work on multiple goals and multiple skills. So we're finding, you know, there's no, there's almost no data from individuals saying this is not aligned to my needs. This is not helping me improve. Um, but we want to make sure that, you know, the, the improvement is seen across the board with the folks that work with them because everyone's going to have their own unique take on what Christopher needs to be a more effective leader. Okay. Got it. No, that, that helps. And I guess my follow-up question, and then we can kind of wrap on this one is, so is part of that journey working with the individuals then to help them determine like who are the right people to get involved to figure out what this 60% 
are how much how much involvement does the end user have in that? Um, so they input right, like who are the direct reports or those key okay. key stakeholders. Um, we don't typically need to like help them identify. Okay. Like they, you know, there's there's some guidance we'll give around. You know, if you have direct reports, you should you should definitely put those people. But it, if you don't, like who are even if you do, who are people you work with on a daily or at least weekly okay. basis? Uh, okay. So yeah. But yeah, it's input coming from the person who's going to get the coaching. Right, exactly. Yes. Okay. So then the question from LinkedIn user, this is probably Boss or Corrine. There's like a handful of people that they always come up anonymous, but I know who you are. Um, so with everything happening with the pandemic, and, and I'm actually curious on this one too, communication is a big topic, but what I've seen, and, and I've been an advocate for since this whole thing happened, is the way you communicate in the digital world, yeah. it's, it's a different application of it. So have you seen kind of a demand and growth for, hey, and I know you said, right, you kind of figure out what the person needs along the way, but has there been an increase in, wow, I, I need to improve the way I communicate in the digital space? Absolutely. This has been a huge um driver of our business. We feel really lucky. Obviously, this is a very difficult time. Um, but we saw a 30% increase in yeah. demand in monthly sessions taken in the month of March when all this hit. And so we've continued to see growth within existing users who are looking at a couple things. One is how to, as, as the person wrote, like how to improve my communication skills in a remote setting. So that could either be related to uh, meetings is typically what we see. Like, how do I speak up in remote meetings? This is much more difficult to do yeah. than it was in an office. Or um, how do I facilitate a meeting? Uh, so those are really popular uh, goals that folks are working on and using skills from that communication track. And then the other one is presentations. Like, how are you presenting things, you know, it's so much easier to do again in a physical space than it is um, remotely. I think the other thing that's driving that surge in demand that we've seen is the loneliness of this. Yeah. So, so many people, um, you know, I'm very fortunate. I know you are as well. Like we've got large families that surround us. And so I've got people Not that everybody does while I'm sheltering in place, but a lot of people don't. And so that's the other trend we're seeing is um, amongst many other trends, particularly with managers that I would love to talk about. But um, a lot of people just feeling lonely and feeling like they need that connection with a coach who they can talk to about things that are related to work, but wouldn't be something that you would feel comfortable confiding in a manager or a direct report about. Okay. I got it. I got it. No. Well, and that makes sense. And you know, it's interesting is that one of the things I've seen with the whole pandemic and as people are, you know, remote, virtual, right, that loneliness is a big one. And because people haven't historically spent a lot of time using digital tech to stay connected and build relationships and kind of fill that, there is a bit of a void that people are, are working through. So I think it's interesting that 30% is a pretty, pretty steep increase on that. But I think the other thing that I've seen come out of this is I think a lot of people overestimated their communication skills mm. and and this situation kind of highlighted maybe I wasn't as good of a communicator as I thought. I just benefited from the luxury of people were around, yeah. right? So I assumed relationships were really good. I assumed people knew what was going on because I happened to talk to them all the time. Suddenly now I don't have that luxury and I'm realizing I've got some serious gaps mm. that I didn't realize I have, and I'm not really sure what to do about them. So it, it doesn't surprise me, but it is interesting to see that that's what you've seen. Particularly writing skills. That's the other one I didn't mention. So writing, you know, one of our advisors, uh, Merritt Anderson, she was the VP of people at GitHub, one of the largest kind of remote first distributed companies, you know, in the world. And she said this quote that stuck with me, which is, um, you know, the written word reigns supreme in a remote distributed world. The written word is so critical. And we're a remote first as a company at Lingo Live. And so I think I kind of took that for granted how important it is. But short form and long form writing. Short form is, you know, this was the guy in the office who was just tapping people on the shoulder and talking. Now he's got to figure out how to do that in Slack or email or some other format. And then long form, really critical so that you don't get inundated with meetings is to um, either eliminate a meeting because it's a document that you could have that people could collaborate asynchronously on 
yeah. or provide adequate context of like, why do you want to have this meeting? What is the idea that you're bringing to the table? You know, why is it relevant to where we're going? And so these are really new skills for a lot of people to try yeah. and wrap their heads around. Um, so that's another big one. That's interesting you bring up the writing point too, because I think that's an important one because there is so much written communication. And the challenge with written communication is you don't have, right, that you lose a lot of the facial expressions, tone, right? A lot of this stuff, you know, and, and I know that uh, I'll just pick on my parents, right? My dad specifically, I'm always trying to talk to him because he'll send texts and he doesn't, I'm like, dad, you seem like a jerk or you, you see, because yeah. the way you're, you're talking yeah. through this is but not right. You get this text. You're like, Oh my word. What, yeah. what you call is like, Oh, Hey, I was just doing this. You're like, I had, okay, we yeah. need to work on your text etiquette. And I just think of some of the things I do you use Grammarly at all. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I love when Grammarly added the whole, it gives you little visual indicators of how your writing yeah. sounds like, is it friendly? Is it stern? Things yeah. like that to be able to say, Hey, the words you're choosing, the way you're saying things right. is, is coming across in a certain way. So I'm sure I, I can imagine that that's an area. So when they do that with these live instructors, then if you're coaching on that, are they sending samples back then? And then they're kind of having a discussion about it. Yeah, so that's a huge part of our methodology is your your role playing, whatever these skills are in the in the classroom. So if you, you know, the idea before you want to articulate your ideas more concisely, you, you're going to do that with your coach and, and he or she's going to give you feedback. But yeah, on the writing piece, you'll bring maybe an email that caused a total storm within your team. And <laughs> that, like, you know, I don't know what happened here. Can you give me feedback? And it's so enlightening for people. Um, I want to say like your dad, but I think we all do it, right? It's oh, like we all do it. It's so enlightening to realize how your message comes across in a written form. And, and I think there's another side of that coin, which is like, it's so easy to send an email or a text versus like, you wouldn't say this to somebody if you were face to face with them in a room, but because it's email, you feel safer. It's a little more distant. So sometimes the work that coach needs to do is next time you're feeling this way, if you are angry, don't just, it's too easy to type something Fire up off an email. Send it to yourself and so and and then or send it to me and we'll talk about it in the next session. And we'll, we'll think about, you know, is this the right way to approach a conversation with this person? And nine times out of 10, it's it's not. Yeah, well, it's it's a good practice. I know if if something comes up and it sets me off, I have a rule that I do not respond to it until I've walked away and cooled off because it does. Right. You fire something off that. I wouldn't come over to your house and just yell at you about this thing, but it's easy to send an email with all caps and a bunch yeah. of exclamation points. And oh, those it. companies who are have literally paid like armies of people to make the user experience as simple as possible for you to communicate things out into the world. And it's, it can definitely work against you. Yeah. Well, and, and the, the second half of that question that came up is, will this trend continue after we return to the office? I don't know about you, but from my perspective, I don't, I don't know that we're, I was reading an article last night that it's like there, this has sparked a movement that, you know, will indefinitely change things. I mean, I think there will be something back, but when I look at these communication skills, I feel like no matter what, we're always going to have this digital hybrid. Even if you're in an office, I mean, I haven't had everyone I work with in the same building. I don't know how long. So I think it's, it's a worthwhile investment. Well, I think, you know, taking COVID aside and the kind of working from home, sheltering in place world, if you look at LinkedIn does um, this skills gap assessment every month, they put out what are um, the, the jobs that can't be filled because of specific skills that candidates lack. And they've been doing this for about 10 years and they, they do this skills gap report. And it was always technical skills, kind of early part of the, the decade. It was a lot of like data science and engineering. Yep. And this kind of quietly, people don't know this, but for the last two and a half years in almost every major city in the United States of America, the number one skill by far, by far is oral communications is just a challenge. So even if we quote, go back to normal, which I agree with you, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Even if we do, like this was already something that was a major um, 
blocker and it, and it makes sense. Like we're highly complex organizations. Things do not, information does not flow in the, you know, the hierarchical model of your no. work. That's not the way that work gets done. So, no. Yeah. You know, and I think, yeah, well, I was talking to Vineet from Microsoft about this when we were talking about Teams, right? There's a lot of these things that we're seeing now and going, wow, we really need to do, but they've been building like a tsunami for, for some time and the assumption that, you know, communication was happening this way or work was being done this way um, is just really, to, in my opinion, just being exposed for what it is. So on that topic, because you brought up the skills thing, Rudy asked a good question. We, we hit on it a little bit about, um, you know, you're actually a big part of this is actually doing assessment and measurement and, and progress in these skills. What does that, what does that look like? Like, how does that actually come together? So, the, it's very simple and basic. And I think sometimes people point to that and say, well, this isn't rigor rigorous or comprehensive enough, or it's too subjective. And I think there, there are pros and cons to both approaches. Um, the reality is people get survey fatigue and they don't want to be inundated with like a 26 question, like, you know, comprehensive assessment. So what we do is we set 397 questionnaire. On. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so what we do is, is we ask you, um, okay, you've chosen, let's say these three skills that you want Christopher to work on, um, on a scale of one to five, how effectively do you feel he uh, performs this skill in the workplace? So again, if it's, you know, empathy and we'll define empathy, like this is what, you know, empathy means, um, how on a scale of one to five, you know, five is he's an expert. He, he uses this with ease. He doesn't do it too much. Um, and then one is like, <laughs> never, I've never seen him really, you know, um, embody this skill. So we asked that question when, before you start the program, we asked that question, this is the exact same question at the midpoint. So I mentioned nine, 18 sessions. We ask you at the nine session mark, we ask those folks again, and then we ask at the end of the program and, and we just show that kind of pre and post, uh, increase. Okay. Got it. Got it. All right. And then that's that's fed back to the individual. Do you also share that with right the manager piece? Like how does that work to kind of keep things moving? Yeah. So that's fed back um, to to the individual, to the manager and to the customer, albeit in different forms. So for the customer, the, the kind of HR learning leader, it's going to be in a dashboard where you're going to be able to see these graphs and maybe okay. you know, be able to segment them. Um, whereas so from the day, I mean, the reason I was asking is from a data standpoint, right? If you're bringing this in, you have kind of dashboard visibility into this. So if you're going back to your stakeholders saying, Hey, what do we, you know, is this working? Are we actually seeing progress? You have that data that you can then see. Yeah. And that's one of four components. So we use the Kirkpatrick scale to really think about like effectiveness of the program where level one is like satisfaction, coach satisfaction ratings, engagement data. Level two is what are the skills that people are working on? How well is that aligned to what the manager or the direct reports wanted, which is really interesting for people to kind of understand their leadership development gap at a okay. kind of pro level. Yeah. Level three is what we just talked about, the behavior change. And then level four is, is results. So we'll also ask, you know, uh, employee NPS scores, how likely are you to recommend X, ABC company, uh, productivity, uh, innovation, revenue. We'll ask you like, how has this program helped you drive any of these kind of results? And then if you if you answer something, then there's a qualitative part. Like, why did you choose revenue? How did you well, and you've got these things for, I mean, you, these people were in this for 18 weeks. So you have time to actually capture some actual data. I think sometimes where you see is like, it's an initiative or an event and then trying to capture, did, did it do anything? Like, well, I don't know, we, we aren't still there, but it sounds like you've got enough time and a big enough runway to see, you know, is this actually taking hold? Yeah, I think the thing we have to figure out now, we're hearing this a lot from customers is like, how do you know a year after the program that they have continued to, you know, use these skills at the level, right? Like, how do you know they don't kind of stagnate? And, and we're trying to figure that out. It's really hard to get someone <laughs> to like, fill oh, out. Bring them back in. Yeah. yeah talk to us a year later. Um, but yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, again, I think even having the data that you're talking about from an impact standpoint is, is a lot more than many organizations have on is what we're doing actually 
delivering on what we're hoping it'll deliver. So yeah, I, I get that's a tough nut to crack. You know, can we figure out if a year, three, five years later it's doing it? But I mean, there's so many variables you'd have to isolate yeah. <laughs> to actually do it. So I'd be interested as you continue down that journey as you as you figure that out. Um, so this actually leads to another question for me is, you know, in terms of your who's your target, right? Because when I'm thinking about this, is this something that an individual would say, you know what, I want to do this. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just going to go because I, I am seeing the democratization of development. And a lot of people are kind of taking ownership and doing their own things. Is this something that individuals could do in theory and say, you know what, I'm just going to go develop on these things? Or is it you know, organizations say, hey, we need to do more coaching, we need a solution. And so organizations, are, is it a combination of both? Where are you, yeah. you said? Um, it's mostly the latter organizations. Okay. We do have some organizations like a Google or a Salesforce where it is, they provide a kind of stipend, they provide, um, you know, a, a learning and development stipend that you can use individually. So that's the closest we get to like an individual just kind of accessing our program and signing up. But usually it's working with companies. Um, So there's two different types of organizations we work with. On the language and communication side, that is typically larger companies, um, typically companies with a large product and engineering um, presence. So I just in some technology companies. Um, Those soft skills that relate to communication uh, are really critical to these technology companies, particularly on the product and engine side. and that's the surge, I think, that we saw that 30% was typically companies that fell into that bucket. So you're looking at anywhere from, you know, 1,000 to 100,000 employees for that, like a large enterprise. And then the leadership track, that's really meant for frontline managers at hyper growth startups. Okay. So a company like Big Commerce is, is a client for that product where it's, um, you know, you're growing quickly from 100 to 1,000 employees you are building a management layer for the first time and you are probably promoting people into management who don't have the relevant skills or expertise to do it. You could, you know, you're doing training, you're doing workshops, but you want to be able to scale some of those foundational leadership principles out to a personalized level where they can work on these skills on a, you know, day to day or week to week basis. Um, So that typically those larger enterprise companies, they have some larger scaled out coaching that they either run or someone. So we work with those hyper, hyper growth startups for that. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. In terms of how it was. And and again, based on what you said in terms of a lot of the model behind it for sustainability and things like that is right. You need that manager, those, those peers, those other things. So, but I was just curious if you had people that just kind of randomly said, Hey, I want to do this too, just on my own. Um, We've okay. talked about it, especially in light of everything going on. We're like, clearly, this is a need. How can we help people? Especially a lot of people who have lost their jobs, and they may right. want. To- I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Is there's got to be a lot of people who just have a need for coaching and don't really know where to turn. Yeah, yeah. There's something there, and it it's, comes down to bandwidth for us. Like we really yeah. just determine my the startup journey. I always tell everyone is like, focus, 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 focus. focus. I know. Um, so there are shiny red balloons all around us, and. and- <laughs> that we can do the million different things that we can do we got to keep focusing on where we're seeing growth because our mission is to empower over a million people to contribute their unique potential in the workplace okay. and we're big believers in the skills-based coaching methodology and and um i have failed many times since i started this company to find the people for whom that is the most valuable mission and are willing to pay you money to make that happen for them now um, and so we feel like we found it and I'm like, I'm very territorial about diverging from no, that. No, I get it. Yeah, I get it. No. And that make I, I've seen it too many times, right? Where entrepreneurs, it's like, well, we could do this and we could do this. And pretty soon you're running in so many different directions. You're not really doing anything very well. And the whole thing just implodes on itself. So, I mean, good for you for staying focused on that. And I think that can be extremely a positive thing. I also like the fact you said, right, help people reach their individual per, per potential. Sorry, because I think th- this is something I've been talking about a lot recently is there isn't this like mold of everybody should look and act like this. It's like, no, we need everybody to reach their their unique individual potential. So I think that's that's a great way of framing it up. That's huge. Like authenticity is a major component of our brand is, um, 
really not teaching you how to be in the workplace. It's helping to unlock that unique potential that for whatever reasons, because you just don't have the skills or structure or no one's kind of, you know, helped you. Helps with it, you. you can't, you know, you can't do that. So the, these are people who don't feel that they can be authentic. They don't feel that they can, you know, bring their potential to work. And, yeah. So instead of, right. And I think that's an important piece that instead of just saying, okay, this is, this is what you should look and act like. So we're just going to, coach you to basically be this it's more no we're working on you with your unique potential your unique capabilities and let's bring that to life let's bring that out so you yeah. don't feel like you're being phony well the first thing is not coaching that's like right or, or instruction you know like that's that's great so some people need that or, or that that plays a critical role in the kind of talent development space but coaching is what you're talking about so yeah okay got that's it what about no, nope. perfect. Well, so the other one I have, right, because this is always a question that I, that I run into or I, I see a lot, right? When we talk about these coaches, so who are who are your coaches? Who are these individuals on the other end of of the Zoom or the Teams or whatever tech you're using to connect with people? Tell me a little bit about them. Yeah, so um, it varies. Obviously, there's like a pretty big diversity of offerings with those tracks, like a language communication and and. Uh, you know, manager or leader coaching. Um, so you, you got to get different coaches for each of those. And then even within those tracks, you have different coaches. So to give you an example, right, if you're, if you look in the manager or leader track, um, you know, we have kind of three broad categories of, of that skills catalog. There's emotional intelligence, uh, there's people skills, and then there's execution. How are you driving results? Um, and so a coach for the emotional intelligence, you know, category is going to be someone with a master's or PhD in psychology. Um, whereas a coach on the like execution side might be a former manager or director who decided they didn't want to do the grind anymore. And they were really passionate about coaching and they got their, you know, ICF certification in coaching to become a full-time coach. Okay. So we look for, um, and this is another way we use technologies. We really look at like, what is the demand for skills across this ecosystem of skills that we offer? Where are we, um, you know, short on coverage, like we only have coverage of coaches for, you know, a certain amount, and we'll go find coaches that have relevant expertise there. One of the things we look for in terms of consistency is, um, you know, across the board, you, you obviously you have to have experience in coaching. So even on the ESL side, if you're coaching someone who's a, you know, intermediate English speaker, you need to have ex at least five years of experience doing that. You need to have some type of certification, and there's all kinds of you okay. know, English is second language certification. Um, whereas on the manager side, you have to have been a manager. You can't, you know, coach someone. You can, but you potentially run a major risk. And we made this mistake early on, actually, where, um, you know, so a, a coach kind of simulated a role play around a conversation that should not have happened. Mm -hmm. And way too early to be having this type of really critical conversation and, it, and it, somebody who had been in a management position before could have asked, well, where where are you in this journey? What have you already you know, talked to this person okay. about? How many times have you brought this up? And then say, OK, so we need to do that first before we start to, you know, have this conversation about performance. That's about like if you don't you know, if you don't deliver, you're out the door. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. OK, well, and that, that gets to, I think, the root of my question, which was understanding, right, the the. I don't know if you want to call it credibility, but yeah, of the coaches. And it sounds like it's a combination of real world experience. So, you know, again, to your point, it's if you're coaching to ma being a manager, you should have walked in those shoes so that you have some experience doing it, but also some of the more um, traditional kind of certifications around the fact that it's like, okay, you also weren't just a manager. So you think you know how to be a manager. You've also been, kind of trained to know how to coach people. Cause some people think they're great coaches. Like, Oh, I'm a really good coach. And like, you actually aren't really a good coach. You're good at telling people how to going back to our earlier point of mm -hmm. you're not helping people unlock their individual capability. You're trying to mold them into a mini you is what you're, what you're good at doing. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think you hit the nail on the head, the certification, again, depending on the track, those certifications are going to be very different. Um, experience in management for the leadership track. And then um, across the board, just experience doing this. We're not going to hire someone who's just recently certified as an ICF coach, but hasn't done this already 
you know, for, for at least five years. So um, those are the three consistencies, but that diversity is what matters. We really focus after you kind of check those boxes, what are the skills that people are really struggling with? Um, and then how do we find unique characteristics amongst the coaching community to help deliver on that? Okay. Got it. So on, I'm going to shift gears a little bit because I am curious about this because I look at coaching and, you know, I, I, we talk about this in the space a fair amount and it's to me, coaching is like the ultimate in personalization, right? Because ultimately this person gets to know you, they get to know your situation, all that stuff. That w w one of the big things we, we kind of talked about in the polls leading up to this, that can be tough to scale. Right. That's that's a lot of times one of the biggest challenges with this is the ability to scale that level of personalization, whether it's cost or resources or or a multitude of different things. So how then does Lingo Live help make that scalable? Because there are a lot of factors that would say we would love to do this, but we can't because yeah. whatever reasons. And I'm sure you, you you've seen all the reasons from people as to, yeah, I love the pitch, love the idea, but yeah. There's just no way. How do you help make that more realistic for people? Well, I think the biggest thing is showing them data around what's going to happen if you don't do this. Okay. Um, so the, the headliner, which I think most of us know, is 50% of people leave their boss. They don't leave a company. Yep. So if you do the math on that, that starts to take care of the cost side. And again, I talked to level four, like we show that data, how um, on average, we see two out of three people who have engaged with our program say they're they're more likely to stay at the company as a result of yeah, the company. So it's actually quantitatively affecting engagement. So that takes care of the cost. I mean, it doesn't take care of the cost side. This is a major challenge. I think even when you have that data, um, there's there's just, okay, but it's still hard for me. This is a thousands of dollars per person. Granted, it's less than half the cost of an executive coach, but it's still, it's still an investment. You know, it's not like a degree, which is, you know, seven dollars a person or LinkedIn learning or something like that. So um, so from that standpoint, then um, the logistics you talked about, too, like, well, we've got managers in, you know, 17 different countries. And that's where it's that that's our unique value prop is the kind of the effectiveness of personalized coaching with the convenience of any time and anywhere. We have close to 200 coaches um, worldwide. We have coverage in every time zone on the planet. Um, we handle all the scheduling, logistics, supply and demand, all that stuff. And then of course the data for you to track and validate how it's working. So that side is, is where we use technology. I think that the challenge is getting people to understand the cost thing. And, and it's a shame because I think what's happening right now is we went through this moment, you know, at the beginning of Q2, where a lot of people leaders, they're just focused on crisis management and like COVID. Stop the bleeding. Yeah. Action plan. Like, okay, how do we just take care of people? How do we think about remote onboarding? How do we give people resources who have, you know, kids at home who aren't in school? And they kind of got through that stage. And now what we're seeing is just a lot of like sit tight and don't spend any money. Yeah. And, but what's happening is that managers are at the, they're being pushed and pulled. So they are being pushed by senior leaders that are saying perform, the performance is more critical than ever. We need to hit results. Like, otherwise we got to do layoffs or furloughs or all these things. Like we, we've got to find a way to get drive performance. What are you doing to drive performance? And then they're getting pulled by their teams who are obviously, you know, dealing with just emotional trauma. And as a result of everything that's happening, they've got people who, again, have kids home from school and they're trying to find a way to balance work and life and not want to strangle their spouse. They have, um, you know, they're a person of color that's dealing with, the, you know, the the ramifications and the, and the movement that we're seeing with um, Black Lives Matter and, and the excitement, but at the same time, maybe some of the hopelessness and maybe they don't feel like they can bring that to work. And so managers are having to deal with that push and pull and at the same time be that kind of mast on the front of the ship to say, hey, don't worry, I got this. Yeah, <laughs> They're human beings. Like you need to invest in these people. They're going to burn out or they're going to start to, which is our, we're already seeing this happen um, with clients who are coming to us, is they are going to start to wear their emotions on their sleeve, of course. And it's going to cause people to lose sight of what matters to the organization and or leave the company. So we're starting to notice that trend shift now where people are okay. realizing managers are the most important inflection point. Okay. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's one of those. That's 
the way you articulate it, I think is, is fantastic. And I think it is one of the things that it's, it can be a tough sell, right? When you're just looking at dollars and cents and you can have all the data saying, Hey, but it works, it changes behavior. But ultimately we have to think about, think about the people and how do you tell that story in a way that doesn't sound squishy and kind of soft and like, well, no, this actually does have a dramatic impact on the performance of your business. This isn't a nice to have, it's a, you need to have it. Well, and it's a time opportunity too. I mean, I, I love the Warren Buffett quote, um, you know, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And this is a time when most of the world's fearful. Um, and so how are you going to act in that time? And certainly there are companies that are hiring a lot because there's amazing talent on the market and they're realizing they can upskill their talent pool. Um, but it causes you to be a little less fearful and be comfortable with, you know, spending money and push, putting your foot on the gas pedal. And so it's a really interesting dichotomy because we're seeing that in the ecosystem and it's hard to see any patterns. It's just certain companies are more forward thinking, long term, innovative. And it's not they're, thinking, they're, they're making the long play, not the short play. But it's not that they're like in a position to do that because they like one of them, the company I talked to yesterday, they they have like 12 months of runway and they're a huge company with like, you know, hundreds of employees, but they're one of these hyper growth startups and they have taken the position of action in the face of crisis. There's a tremendous amount of opportunity. We're going to invest in our managers because they're going to help us take advantage of this. And um, so it's, it's really interesting to me to see that, like, who are those that are being greedy when others are fearful versus, you know, being fearful when not. Interesting. I was reading a study, it was maybe last week or something like that, um, about the companies back in the 08 crisis. And the ones that came out on top were the ones that actually, to your point, and Warren Buffett's quote, they were the ones that leaned in and said, it's bad right now. But now's the time, to your point, we're going to put our foot on the gas because that's counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. And when everybody else is, you know, locking up, holding on, afraid to do you know this other stuff we're going to actually go because we can move faster we can you know be more effective and scoop up all this stuff that others are just ignoring because they're just keeping their heads afloat it's super hard like i'm a leader it's of a so business. hard yeah yeah i'm like i could do a better job i mean i definitely could do a better job i'm not full you know pedal to the metal right now so yeah. <laughs> easier said than done okay Okay. So then the other thing, you talked a little bit about this from the kind of scalability. I want to kind of tie a bow on this one a little bit because you've got people in different time zones, things like that. The global nature of things is is always tough, right? If you're in a big global distributed organization, that that can be tough. So two things. One, you know, how how do you manage to have these people all over the place? And And let's say from a scalability, let's say next week, somebody comes and goes, we have all these different people that we need to do across the globe. How do you manage to scale that up? Because you can say, yeah, we've got 200 coaches now. What if 200 is not going to cut it? How do you how do you manage to make that scalable so you can grow if you needed to? So every single time, this has never happened once that the client moves faster than we do. Okay. Uh, so they all, we, not always, we do hear this sometimes where they say like, Hey, we're a large global organization. We'd want to roll this out to, you know, hundreds of people next week. <laughs> That's and what they say. That's what they say next week. Right. And then procurement gets involved and maybe HR business partners want to get involved. And meanwhile, all that kind of internal process, we are meanwhile going to our coaching community. So 90% of the coaches we bring on are um, through the coaching community. And so referrals from existing coaches, okay. we have a really high coach NPS score. We, we do a lot to take care of our coaches. Um, and we find that those are the best coaches too. Um, and so we can get a new coach spun up in two to three weeks if they have the capacity to really go through our onboarding process. Um, so it's always the client that we're waiting on. And we work with a lot of large global multinational, like very high demand, but it typically takes them, you know, months and it takes a day. <laughs> yeah. It's funny because it's it's true, right? I mean, so often it's we have to do this and we have to do it next week. And I'm like, well, okay, we'll work on that. And, and there, there was one time where it was close where it was, wow, we were surprised they were moving faster than we thought. But even then you just do it in cohorts. Like we're never gonna rush the coaching onboarding and make sure like we have a pretty thorough process to make sure that these coaches can actually 
have the skills, but also can deliver on this methodology. And so in that instance, we said, let's do it in two cohorts, three months apart. And of course they were, they were fine with that. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know what, Tyler, we could probably continue talking about coaching for quite some time if we needed to, but this has been really great. Um, you know, any other, I guess my one last question to you is you talked about having this, this focus on where, where you are, where you want to go with things. What, how do you continue seeing this evolving and expanding? Is it to just take this to more organizations? Is it to diversify where you're going? I'm curious where, where will Lingo Live be next time we talk? Cause I think originally when we talked, you really were focused on the language. Now yeah. it's continuing to move into some of these human skills. What, what's the future hold? So um, I mentioned before, the mission is to empower over 1 million people to okay. contribute their unique potential in the workplace. Started this company eight years ago. We're at like 20,000. So we got a long way to go to get to that million, but we're adding, you know, we're growing exponentially. So, um, you know, I'm a bit of a numbers kind of geek and I've done the math that like we can get there in 20 years if we keep growing. 20 years, okay. The rate that we're growing at. Um, and by the way, a lot of people hear a million people and they think, why aren't you being more ambitious? Why, why not a billion people? And I come back to that analogy of like, this is a 18 week program. You're spending, you know, lots of time on it. This is not the same thing as, you know, checking social media or something. This, this isn't, you sign up for a course, you go through it on your own and then you're done. Yeah. There's thousands of dollars per person. So like we build a very big business if we can do this for a million people. Um, and so to your question, like the way that we get there is we are just slowly chipping away at what are those fundamentally human skills. When I say contribute your unique human potential, it is because if you look at um, what's happening in the workplace and where people are upskilling, automation, artificial intelligence, this is all looking at what are those skills that are uniquely human, critical thinking, um, compassion, right? Like empathy, uh, you know, communication skills, like these are things that are going to be very difficult for computers to replace. And those are going to be the things that, you know, my daughter's almost four years old, like in 20 years when she's in the workplace, you're going to need to have those skills. That is not going to be viewed as like executive presence or leadership skills. That is, that is what table stakes. <laughs> To get a job because every other job's been kind of automated away. So, um, so that's the path is is getting there slowly, and and so that's the reason for the kind of language to communication and now some of those leadership skills. Okay, so staying on the staying on the forefront of what are the most critical skills that make us innately human, especially going back to the COVID thing, the technology thing's not going away either, right? As computers right. are just going to continue to do more and more of our things. I've, I've been saying this for a while, right? The, the human skills, the need for that is just going to continue to rise. So that's the plan. You'll keep expanding your portfolio in that arena, if you will. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? I shouldn't have asked that question because now I want to dive into <laughs> how you're how you're going to do that and what all that looks like. But I know that we would then end up be being here much longer than uh, than we had originally planned. So maybe another time. We can do it anytime you want. Yeah, let's talk about it. I'm sure I would learn a lot from you. I don't have all the answers. So I would, I would probably be asking you more questions than you would. Yeah, be. well, we'll see, we'll see about that. I don't have all the answers either. But um, this was great, Tyler. I really appreciate you making the time. I'm glad uh, we were able to do this. Great engagement from everybody who's tuning in. I really hope you got something out of this, not only around coaching and human skills, but um, you know what Lingo Live is doing to help with this. Because I do think that whatever you're doing, investing in your people is is critical to organizational success. It's not a nice to have, kind of like we've said with other things. It's not a nice to have, it's a must have. So thank you, Tyler. Have a wonderful weekend. Have a wonderful weekend, everybody who's been watching. Uh, we will see you next week.